Good morning, Boker Tov, Shmuel the Running Tour Guide, coming to you from one of our favorite places, the Judean Desert. Look behind me, you can see the settlement called Mitzpe Yericho. And of course, Dr. Tobia Book joining me on another journey as we open up this incredible territory for you in the footsteps of Herod, uncharted territory. We're taking a road we've never taken before. We'll see how far we can go. And then we'll build on the theme of today, Kipros and the desert fortresses. Look at this incredible location. Just to plug you into where we are, we're standing in the Judean desert. I'm gonna firstly point in the direction of the Sumerian desert, so that is looking north. If I move this way, we start to look east towards Jericho. Jericho is right in the bottom of the valley, in the Syrian African Rift Valley. As the sun rises over the mountains of Moab, you can get a glimpse of the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea, the most salty body of water in the lowest physically inhabited place on Earth. And looking south, we're looking towards the Negev. On the map, there we are, next to Vered Yericho, St. George's Monastery is covering where we are, Mitzpe Yericho, but midway between Jerusalem and the northern part of the Dead Sea. Let's plug in a little bit more. That's the juxtaposition of the old and the new. The new is this beautiful Yeshua, founded after the Six Day War, 1967. You can really see how the Jews come and make the desert bloom, surrounded by brown and yellow, and when the Jews return to our land, we have the beautiful flourishing green. Hand the camera over from the new, we get not just to the old, we get to the very old. In fact, one of the oldest cities on the planet Earth is in the plain in front of me, and this, of course, is the biblical city of Yericho, of Jericho. And we all know Jericho from the Bible, which I just happen to have on me, um, as the city where the walls came tumbling down. And there are remains of Jericho going all the way back to the Neolithic period, that's 6,000 years ago, in this very city right behind us. It's one thing to be sitting in Hebrew school thousands of miles away from the Holy Land and reading black and white words on a page in the book of Joshua. It's another thing to get a 3D visual of what exactly we're talking about. And that's what's incredible. In the land of Israel, you see everything in three dimensions, not just the two dimensions in the Bible, but it comes out of the Bible page and you really get a visual and understand it. Let's have a look. Over here in the book of Joshua, sentence number seven from the second chapter. Vayomer Adonai El Yehoshua Hayom Hazer Achel Gadelcha Bnei Kol Yisrael Asher Yedun Ki Kasher Hayiti Im Moshe Eye Imach. And God said to Joshua, This is the day when you will become great in the eyes of Israel, and they will know, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And this is a message of encouragement that Joshua gets on the eve of the entry to the Holy Land of Israel. After wandering for years in the desert, it's finally time to come in and to the Promised Land itself. So you're telling me the Israelites just came in and took Jericho? As simple as that? Well, that's what we learned in school, but when you actually look at the good book, not this good book, that good book, <laughs> you actually see uh, that a few things that happened. There was a slight dramatic pause. We, if we start off with the uh, fourth chapter in the, the book of Joshua, first of all, he, he asked for 12 people. Who lachem mina am shtem asa anashim, a representative of each tribe, and they have to go, and each one has to hold a stone. And on top of that, you think, okay, great, it's symbolic, we have representative of all the tribes, we've got a stone, let's go and take Jericho. But no, then they go and they take the Ark of the Covenant and they put it not in the middle to protect it, not in the back to protect it, but rather at the front of the uh, entire procession who's about to cross the Jordan so River. Every synagogue we go to where the sentence is always above the Ark, Dalif Ne Miat Ahmed, know before who you stand. So they're inspired by the Holy Ark of the Covenant with the, with the second set of the Ten Commandments inside them to lead the way. So they understand this is a spiritual entry to their, to their ancestral homeland. And when they get to the Jordan, which is not exactly the mighty Mississippi, what happens? They could have just found a, a narrow spot to cross over, but instead they go to a slightly wider spot and just like the Red Sea, the river parts. 
and their walk through on the dry land to the land of Israel and cross the Jordan River. And not only does it show the people of Israel that God is with Yahshua, Joshua, as he was with Moses, the, as the water parted for both of these leaders, but also the people who live, the kings who live in Canaan, understand that there's a mighty force with the Jews that defies nature. This is a supernatural occurrence beyond nature. Okay, message delivered. Supernatural help for the Jews. What do they do when they get to the other side? Attack Jericho? No, they pause and each of the 12 princes builds a big monument, a Gal Ed of the 12 stones on this side of the Jordan River. Why? The message there is very simple, to show that united we stand and divided we fall. That we need to work together as one to accomplish anything. Great, message delivered, let's take Yericho. No, what happens then is even stranger. They get to Jericho and rather than take it, the good book says, they stop and they celebrate Pesach, Passover. Why? Why stop? You've lost the element of surprise. You're camped outside and you're celebrating Passover. And the message is to remind us what we are fighting for, to know where we come from. We were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt. We have a common past as a people. And our yearning and our hope always in the Shanahab Abu Shalain to be in Jerusalem next year. And that is exactly what the message was. In other words, it wasn't just a battle of conquest and blood and pillage, but rather it was a spiritual battle. And the Jews had to be reminded as a people, as a community, about the holiness of their mission. Great. Message accomplished. Let's go and take Jericho. No, one more pause. And this pause is a very interesting pause and a quite a painful pause actually, which says, um, that they were given a second circumcision, the, the people. What does that mean, a second circumcision? Don't forget they've been wandering through the desert for decades. They finally get to the Holy Land and they need to renew their covenant with God. So this is what happens. There's many, many educational symbolic stops. And finally, uh, after all of this has happened, after the, after the waters are parted, after they've been led by the Ark, after they have celebrated Passover, after they build their monument and renew their covenant, then they are spiritually and emotionally ready to enter the Holy Land, the inheritance of the Jewish people forever. And this is a great story for the Tanakh. What's absolutely amazing, once again, is we can actually see Jericho right behind us. This is where it all happened. It's where the Jewish people became a nation in their land. Forever. Okay, we'll quickly take you into the bunker. We get to the main room over here, and look out of the machine gun slits into the Judean desert. is kind of like a modern Kipros, in a sense. A fortress on a hill, indeed. Exactly the same strategic concept. Protecting, protecting the hills of Judea from the east. I'm going to zoom in. We're actually heading further northeast now. Uh, we're going to be running down towards the valley of Wadi Kilt. And where my finger is pointing is the hill of Kipros. And our aim is to uncover one of these desert fortresses and make you understand the importance of the location at the eastern entrance of Wadi Kilt, which heads further west up towards Jerusalem. Okay, we've arrived on the foothills of Kipros. Breathtaking view of Jericho, one of the oldest inhabited places on earth, brand new territory for two experienced tour guides. Would you believe it? We've never made it here. So it's a first for you and we. The royal, the royal we. Okay, Dr. Book, I've got a sneaky suspicion. It's right in front of us. Idea. Oh, must be that iconic fortress shape 
we've seen a few, we've vlogged a few. I'll just remind you of the six desert fortresses rooted in the times of the Hashmonaim, the Maccabees, later taken over by Pompeii and adopted by King Herod. The names are as follows. Masada, Machelaus, Hyrcania, Kipros, where we are, Sartaba, further north, and Herodian. Fortresses littering the land. We haven't reached the peak yet, but just above us is a small surface area, so not much human activity there. But if you look behind us, it is clear as daylight that human hands has changed the landscape here. And you can see all these rocks, we're gonna head out there and we're gonna try and make sense of this site sitting on the edge of the desert overlooking Jericho. But do yourselves a favor, look at the links above, click on Masada off the beaten track and Hirkania, the two sites that we've already brought to you in the footsteps of Herod. And before we enter the site, it'll give you much more of an understanding as to why here and why these six desert fortresses, five of them being west of the Jordan and one being on the eastern banks in the mountains of Moab. Dr. Tovia Book, any ideas why this part of the hill is flattened and settled, whereas as far as we know, when we get to the peak, it's a small surface area and probably just a cistern or two. on top of this hill overlooks Jericho, which wasn't just an oasis in the traditional sense, but a major source of industry. Most of uh, the dates and date honey all came from this oasis town, the city, and it was so well known that when Cleopatra uh, met with Antony, she demanded the city of Jericho to be given over to her. That's how rich it was. So this fortress overlooks Jericho, which not only was a rich, prosperous merchant city, but also contained not one, but two of Herod's uh, winter palaces, which we will see on the other side wow. of the mountain. So to summarize in four words, this place is cool. Let's check it out. What I love doing is allowing your fingers to do the walking. I'll do the talking. Check at this. Coming out of here, you can literally pull out pieces of history that haven't moved in thousands of years. And here's a beautiful piece. This is the corner of an ancient oven. Could be the AIG or the Defy. I've been killed to see this. And here it is actually very light in weight was this used to harden the pottery wow where, we, where the fire was and you could if there's any soot you could find it but back then when you broke the pots you couldn't just go to the local shop and buy one you just had to make more so a palace like this would obviously have its own kiln to manufacture local pottery to replace the broken pottery not the expensive imported terra sigillata but just local pots and pans because they didn't have disposables they break and they would just make more in situ in the place <laughs> Absolutely this is amazing. from that kiln, from the palace kiln. Yeah. Well, no time to kiln. It's getting hot in here. It's pretty much like an oven outside. Before we go, let's have a look at the view of Jericho on the northern edge of Kipros, which affords us probably the best view of Jericho. And you can make out this wide, flat valley on the banks of the Jordan. And wow, we're going to have to strain our eyes. But what we'll do is we'll put a pointer in for you. And you can clearly see more human activity. Those are not fortresses, but palaces. Palaces from which period? So down in the valley over here, you can see two palaces that were originally built by the Hasmoneans, by the Maccabees. That's a dynasty that uh, ruled independently for 100 years between more or less 164 and 63 BCE. And later on, these palaces were rebuilt and reconstructed and re-beautified by your friend of mine, King Herod. And down in the valley, there's actually two of them. There's one over there by the greenhouses, a huge complex. On the other side of the valley, there's an artificial hill, which was another palace as well. And these were Herod's winter palaces, again, built on top of the Hasmonean winter palaces. And they contain, even today, startling remains of pools and and uh, Roman bathhouses and royal greeting rooms. These were amazing things in the, in the cold winters of Jerusalem. The royal family would come down here where it's warm all year round. And in this palace pool, one of the most infamous incidents of Herod's early reign happened. And that was when uh, 
his brother-in-law who was he appointed the high priest Alexander the temple came out of services with his royal robes on and his priestly robes and he was amazingly good looking and the people said oh it's a shame we don't have any of these Maccabees ruling us anymore word got to Herod's ears and that very evening invited his brother-in-law who was young and fit and handsome and above all a really good swimmer into the winter palace compound to take a swim as he took a swim even though he's a very good swimmer he ended up dying in a mysterious drowning accident whilst two of Herod's bodyguards were putting him under the water okay I'll quickly take you to the peak Here we are at the top. Much, much smaller surface area. But lots to see nonetheless. I'll take you to the highest point. And here we have it. We have the cistern, we have the bait mayim, the house of water, hydraulic plaster holding in the water that is needed to survive out here in the desert. Down comes the rain, in comes the water. No rain here, we're in a rain shadow desert. It rains in the hills of Jerusalem. Water gushes eastward, drastically dropping down to where we are, funneled into an aqueduct forced into the cistern, fill up these pools, fill up these cavities, and you have enough water to survive a hot summer in the Judean desert. Magnifique. Now it's time to head into the valley to go and see the flowing waters of Wadi Kilt, freshen up and enjoy the rest of the day. Down into Wadi Kilt we go, heading for some water. St. George Monastery, Wadi Kilt. The silence of the desert. And the footsteps of Dr. Tobia Book. Here's the shepherd. Sabah al khair. Sabah al nur. Salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Sharha? Kama? Yes. Kama, kama. Madra. Mea? Madra. Allah khalil al baraka. Al baraka? Allah. Allah khalil al baraka. Al baraka, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Okay. This is a local shepherd. Jericho? 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 Kif Allah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, good thing we got that on the goat pro. And we just about to be bitten by a dog. I ain't afraid. They sense the fear, they'll get you. Here's the other one. Oh, we're on the wrong path. Here we go. Hazak. Okay, we're running through the desert monastery. 
of St. George, the Holy Fire. Holy Fire, right man! <laughs> what a spectacularly beautiful location. Settled in the monastic times, 5th, 6th, 7th century, monks made their way out here, there's water, there's solitude, there's spirituality. Back then, right up till today, heading into the future. A little mini rainforest. Check inside this cave, it's dripping, it's green, it's fresh, it's full. And an aqueduct crossing the stream. You can see the modern one just over there, which actually is full of water. We're planning to get up there to have a swim in the waters of that aqueduct. Now, some of these are rooted in Herodian times, Byzantine times. Crusader times, Mamluk times, Ottoman times, and today's times. That is good. I'll do that. It's worth every step. Especially when you get to the top. Made it. Woo! That was an off the beaten track track. There was no track. We took a shortcut to get up here. Well worth it. Here we are, right next to the aqueduct, which would have followed a 2,000 year old aqueduct. This one's a bit fixed up for modern times. Coming up, an infinity pool in the desert. Slipstreaming a mule in the desert. The Messiah on his donkey. This is Mule against Samuel. That mule is faster than this mule. But no worries. Sam, you well next to the well of the aqueduct. Oh, look, <laughs> My gosh, Dr. Book, you have no idea what just happened there. Oh, I found the shepherd. I got to the pool. It was crowded. He wouldn't let me film. And basically got hounded by the dogs, mind the pun. And uh, he gave me safe passage out of there. Really? What a nice bloke. Amazing. Oh. That's a lot to think about. Seriously. Well, I'm glad you're having a good time. So, no infinity pool for you guys today. Forgive me if I have sinned. But you shall be blessed with a beautiful dip in an ancient aqueduct. Mm -hmm. See you in the water. And the best way to finish the day. Yeah. Ah. Oh. This is the life. I hope you guys have enjoyed that little run around Kipros, the waters of Wadi Kilt, and these extremely rich hills. Hit the subscribe button. Follow us through the land of Israel, wishing you all a happy weekend and hope to see you soon. Peace. Man goes where no woman has ever gone before to the Markolit.
برای خود در مهر نظامم شهکو نیه بابا ایمه and the river spreads. Why do you think that happened? Well... It's <laughs> <laughs> funny, <laughs> Jordan. Jordan. <laughs> the red... The... <laughs> Shut it off. Let me just talk. Everything pauses, they cross over the Jordan River, which miraculously parts. Sorry. I'm okay with it. Why do you think that happened? Well... It's... <laughs> 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 <laughs>